As we prepare to look tonight at Revelation chapter 12, a challenging text of prophecy. If you don't have an outline, um, you can raise your hand. I think some back, back here still has outlines. Raise your hand good and high and they'll try to get one of the outlines to you. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation is a, a special kind of prophetic literature. It's called apocalyptic literature. And if you look on the front of your outline here, let me explain something about it. Apop apocalyptic literature is symbolic prophecy. Not all prophecy is filled with as much symbolism as Revelation, Daniel, and Zechariah, which are the basic three apocalyptic prophetical books. But one of the things that's unique about this kind of literature is it is cyclical in nature. Let me explain what that means. I won't take time to go into it all. You can read it later for yourself. But we've been reading the book of Zechariah. And I mentioned this morning that chapters 9 through 14 are messianic prophecies. Prophecies regarding the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. But the prophecies come in cycles. And if you don't understand that, when you read Zechariah, you're scratching your head saying, well, what does this apply to? Because in chapter 9, verses 1 to 8, those prophecies were fulfilled in the 4th century, just a couple of centuries after Zechariah. But then you come to verse 9, which talks about the daughters of Jerusalem rejoicing because your king is coming, riding to you on the back of a donkey. That is a prophecy regarding the first coming of Jesus Christ in the first century. And there isn't a break there between verses 8 and 9 that says, hey, there's a, there's a change here. We only know it because we're looking back. Then verses 10 to 17, and when you read that, I was going to take some time to read it tonight, but I, I really shouldn't. But read it. It's exciting. You look at what the prophecy is about when Jesus Christ comes back again and is so clear and exciting and triumphant. That's verses 10 to 17. But then when you get to chapter 10, verse 1, the cycle starts again. Verse 1 through chapter 11, verse 3, is all fulfilled in the Old Testament time. You get to chapter 11, verse 4 to 17, that is fulfilled in the first coming of Christ. It even prophesies down to the detail that the 30 pieces of silver which were used to betray Jesus were thrown out and they bought a potter's field. And that is exactly what happened. And then chapter 12, verse 1 through chapter 13, verse 1, clearly defines the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's the cycles that I'm talking about. Revelation is apocalyptic literature, and it is written in cycles. And there are two cycles. Cycle number one is chapters 1 through 11. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are in the first century. Those are real first century churches, those seven churches in the book of Revelation. They are not a scan of history, as some would tell you. They are real churches in the first century. Chapter 4 and 5 is an interlude in heaven. Chapter 6 was a review from, uh, of, from the cross to His coming. And chapters 7 to 11 that we've been looking at recently is the great tribulation and His second coming. So you have a lot of time spent in the first century a glimpse of His second coming. The second cycle, as you'll see tonight, begins in chapter 12. Chapter 12 goes back to the first century and the birth of Christ and the persecution of the early church. Then in chapters 13 and 14, you see a more expanded description of the Great Tribulation and, and the rapture. Verses 15, uh, chapters 15 to 18, the bowls of wrath after the rapture. 19 and 21, Christ's return in His earthly reign. And in 21 and 22, new heavens and new earth. So where the first one had three chapters in the first century and a little bit about the second coming, the second cycle has a little bit about the first century, just one chapter, and a lot of detail about the second coming. We begin tonight with the second cycle in chapter 12. Pay careful attention to the reading of God's holy and inerrant word. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with a sun, with a moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. 
an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns in his head. And his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And a child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and a half a time, out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with a torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman, and he went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. That is, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Let us pray. Father, very many times Revelation is a difficult book to understand. But I believe that you did not give us this book to confuse us. But rather to make clear what we need to expect in this world. Lord, I pray for your spirit tonight to fill me that I might clearly proclaim your word and to fill all of us that we might respond with hope and courage to face the battle before us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Frank Peretti's novel, This Present Darkness, I think my favorite chapter is the chapter that describes a congregational meeting. I've been in enough of them. But that one particular congregational meeting was interesting because it was filled with people who were coming to make a decision as to the future of the young pastor, Bush. There were many who came very supportive of this pastor, and there were those who came in firm opposition against him. They were opposed to him because he preached boldly the word of God, and he also was involved in disciplining one of the men who was a very well-known and prestigious man in the congregation and in, uh, in the community. And the pastor had followed the scriptures and had disciplined them. And so there was this question within the congregation, what are we going to do with Bush? They met at a congregational meeting. What was so picturesque about this, as described in the book, is that there were in the room, not only a room filled with people, but also a room that was filled with angels and demons. Well, the angel and demons who, angels and demons who were invisible to the watching people in the congregation were engaged in a battle up in the top of the sanctuary there, and they were fighting and slashing each other with flaming swords and cutting each other. While that was going on in the invisible realm, down in the earthly realm, the two sides were fighting and slashing each other with cutting words and comments. When the vote was finally taken, there was a concern that it would be so close that they didn't want anybody to cheat, and so they got one man from each side to come up and count. And while he was counting, one of the demons put it in the heart of the man to hide some of the ballots 
so that his side would win. And he had them in his hand, and what looked as though he inadvertently dropped them, what we saw in the book is that an angel touched his hand and made him drop them. That's a novel. It is one man's attempt to try to put some realism to Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 6 that said our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. And if we fault Peretti for giving too much realism to it, and perhaps he does, then we must also fault ourselves for giving too little realism to it. For that we do. But I think Peretti had portrayed accurately one particular thing, and that is that oftentimes the spiritual warfare between Satan's forces and God's angels is recreated in our world in the lives of those who follow Christ and those who are devoted to Satan. That is portrayed in the imagery of Revelation chapter 12. That the spiritual warfare that is taking place that we don't know anything about, we can't see. That it is being recreated in the lives of the people that are on this world. We're going to look tonight at the characters involved in this, then the story, and then finally the application to our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. But the way John in the book of Revelation begins is he announces... The characters. He begins with the announcement of the characters in chapter 12, verses 1 to 5. And there are three. There is a son, there is a woman, and there is a dragon. And I'm going to begin tonight, first of all, introducing you to the son. A male who was born. Look with me at verse 5. She gave birth to a son, a male child. Now, if I don't read any further... I don't read what goes before it, and I don't read after it. Your imaginations can run wild as to who this male child is. Let me tell you some of the examples that come down through us in church history. Some people believe that this refers to Constantine, the first Christian emperor. There's another man who believes that the male child denotes the manly, vigorous growth of the people of God. There's another who says that this male child is a Nicene Creed. Another person says it's the Church of Rome. You take a little phrase like that out of its context, you can come up with all sorts of fanciful ideas of who the male child is. But to identify the male child, we're told two things in the context. First, he was snatched up to God and to his throne. You look at verse 5 and it goes on to say at the last part of it, her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. How many people do you know that were caught up in the clouds and taken to the throne of God? I know of only one, and that is Jesus Christ, who was born as a male child. We're told a second thing, not only what he was going to do, but also what he will do in the future. He will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Verse 5 says, She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. It's a prophecy from Psalm chapter 2, verse 9, that is fulfilled and declared as to exactly who Jesus is, the one who one day will rule the nations with an iron scepter. And so the male child, I don't think, is any question that it would be Jesus Christ in the first century. Then there was a woman. A woman clothed with the sun. Verse 1 says, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. Now, our first thought might be drawn to the fact that this must be Mary. If the sun is Jesus, then Mary gave birth to him, so this should be Mary. I'd like to suggest to you that when we read the context, and I can't uh, show it to you all now, but you'll see it develop in the sermon, that it's much broader than just Mary. Mary certainly would be an example of who it is that he's speaking of here. But Mary came from a line, a line that goes all the way back into the book of Genesis, the line of Seth. And that line was called the sons of God. 
And then through Isaac came the promise and through David came the lineage. And on down there, what you have is a picture of Mary as one woman who stands as a symbol for all the people of God. All of those who love him, who keep the testimony of Jesus. It's a picture of the church in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the people of God. I think it fits again with some of the symbolism. She is royalty, it says in verse 1. She's a woman clothed with a sun with a moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. And both in the Old Testament, for Israel, the church of the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, the church, both of them were described as a royal priesthood. The church of Jesus Christ is royalty. And we're also told in the book of Revelation that one day we will reign with Jesus for a thousand years. Secondly, we're told that she was pregnant. In verse 2, she was pregnant, cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Again, this is Mary who actually gave the birth, but Mary being one of the children of God, being a part of the true Israel, being a part of the church. This is the picture of Jesus Christ being born, not among pagans, but of the Jews, God's chosen people. And then there's the dragon. A dragon enormous and red. Verse 3. Then another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. Again, there's no question as to who the red dragon is. If you look with me over in verse 9 of chapter 12, it says, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He names the dragon. And it is Satan himself, the accuser. We're told something about him in verse 1. We're told that he flung demons to the earth. You may not have picked up that word. It isn't there. But look at verse 4 again. It says, His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. You have to be very careful with imagery. I have mentioned this before. Symbolism is a picture to describe something real. And it has always fascinated me to see that in the book of Revelation, like chapter 9, verse 1, for example, that a star is used to describe an angel. And we know that demons are angels. God had created angels, and some of those angels fell when Satan did, and some did not. But there are angels and there are demons, but those demons are like the angels, only evil and committed to Satan. But I've always been fascinated with the fact that it seems that when Jesus was born, and you read the New Testament, you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, have you ever noticed how many demons he was casting out? Every city he went to, they brought the sick and those possessed with demons, and he was casting them out left and right. You read the Old Testament, and there's some mention of, of demons, but there's not that much. It just seemed that there was such a flurry of demonic activity at the birth of Christ. And I look at this and say, that would make sense. If indeed a star is an angel, that Satan didn't take these planetary objects up there that are larger than the earth and take a third of them and put them down in the earth, which would be overkill. I mean, there's no way. But that what he did when he was hurled down at the birth of Christ, as you'll see in a moment, his tail swept a third of the demons and brought them right down to this earth and a lot of them sent it right in Jerusalem to do battle. Second thing that happened with the red dragon is he wanted to devour the male child. Last part of verse 4 says, The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. That was happening. In a spiritual warfare, that was happening. In the opening scene that I described to you where there's a spiritual war going on and it's being recreated on earth, Satan, the red dragon, was sitting right there as the church, Mary in particular, was about to give birth to this male child and he wanted to devour him. But who was it who was recreating this on the earth? Who was the one trying to take his life? King Herod. Herod's not talked about here, but he is the one who finally in fulfillment was the one who 
acted out on this planet that which was the spiritual warfare going on where the dragon wanted to eat him and he used Herod to try to do it. But with those characters before us, the son being Jesus, the woman being Mary, but broader, the whole church of whom she represents, and the dragon being Satan, I want us to look at an analysis of the story itself as it unfolds here in Revelation chapter 12. First of all, there is a war in heaven. Verse 7 puts it this way very clearly. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. And you can imagine it. You can picture it. If God is going to send His Son into the earth, Satan is not going to take it sitting down. That act of God broke out into a huge war between Michael and the forces of the dragon. It would have been a wonder to be able to see. There's a man, Benjamin Britten, who captured a little bit in the, his music of uh, Christmas called A Ceremony of Carols. I think this part of the poem is printed there in your outline tonight. Listen to how it puts it. This little babe, so few days old, is come to rifle Satan's fold. All hell doth at his presence quake, though he himself for cold do shake. For in this weak, unarmed wise, the gates of hell he will surprise. There's that little baby in a manger, cold because of the air. And all the forces of Satan are just at their wit's end because the baby has come. And the dragon wants to do whatever he can to devour the child and put him to death. The result of this war that took place, the time that Jesus was born, is that Satan was cast down from heaven. Verse 8. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. And he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Now some might say right off the bat, now wait a second. I thought that he was hurled down from heaven way back at the Garden of Eden. Well, you do read and the book of Isaiah, and again, I think this is symbolism, but in Isaiah chapter 14, it describes Satan as the one who, in his pride, raised himself up and wanted him to make himself out to be equal with God. And God struck him down, and he fell. And when he entered into Garden of Eden, it is because he had been cast out of heaven at that particular point. But after the book of Genesis, there is a picture for us in a book of the Old Testament called the book of Job. Where was Satan when the book of Job opens? He was in heaven. He entered into the throne room of God and he demanded Job's life. And it's interesting, though, even though Satan who had fallen and was on this earth way back in the Garden of Eden, yet he seemed to have access to the throne of God. And I wonder, I cannot absolutely prove this, but I wonder if when that battle took place at the birth of Jesus, when Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, and the result was that he was cast down, whether that meant that no longer, no longer, does Satan have access to the throne of God? He is here on this earth. The Bible goes on to say in verse 10, Now have come the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of God, and the authority of His Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. He is on this earth. And right now, this is His domain. And as the story unfolds, the woman flees. If you look with me at verse 13, again, this is why I say this took place in the first century. It says in verse 13, when the dragon saw that he had been hurled down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Now this is where the story can either get confusing or extremely interesting. 
And I was studying this for many years, and it used to be always confusing to me. And then I began to go back into history, in church history, and all of a sudden, the story that is being proclaimed here began to become clear in really an exciting way. In verses 13 and 14, it's talking about the dragon being hurled down, and now he's pursuing the woman, who is not just Mary, but is the church of Jesus Christ. And it tells us that in this pursuit, verse 14, that the woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to a place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and a half a time. Isn't that nice and clear? There's a couple places that phrase time, times, and a half a time appears in the Bible. One is the book of Daniel. The other is here in Revelation. It occurs a couple times in Revelation. But what that is a picture of in terms of time is one, times is two, and a half a time. You add it all together, you get three and a half. It's symbolism for three and a half years. Now let me take you back to verse 6. Because verse 6 says in the condensed form what verses 13 and 14 say. The woman fled into the desert, a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. If you have a calculator, how many years is that? Three and a half years. So he's saying the same thing. In these two phrases, Satan the dragon is cast down to the earth. His first intent was to devour the male child, but that did not work. And now he's pursuing the woman, not Mary, but the church for which she stands. He is intent on destroying the church. But God takes the church in its infancy in the book of Acts and He protects the church. It doesn't actually take it into the desert. They were still in Jerusalem. But the desert is imagery because when you look at verse 6, the key word that I underline in my Bible is the word prepared for by God that she might be taken care of. Care. That is the point of the imagery that God is going to protect the church for three and a half years. Now let me back you up to the first century. Jesus began His ministry, and His ministry was three and a half years long. From the time of His death, His resurrection, and ascension into heaven, until a persecution arose in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8 was three and a half years. And during that three and a half year period, the church was cared for by God. It was protected by God in an incredible way. You read the book of Acts chapter 2, and they met together, breaking bread, worshiping God every single day. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great to just be with Christians every day and sing praises and fellowship? It'd be wonderful. And during that time, the church grew. There was a little persecution, but it was all persecution by intimidation. The Sanhedrin saying to Peter and John, don't preach in Jesus' name anymore. And Peter and John said, well, you judge for yourselves. Who do we obey, God or man? And they went out and preached, and nothing happened to them. There were miracles performed. The church grew. But back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, God had given them a commission. He said, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel, beginning in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And three and a half years later, the church is right there in Jerusalem. Protected, growing, strengthened as a body, and they're ready to go. Now I ask you, if you were in a church like that, that had all that nurture and all that warmth and all that love and people respected the church, now after three and a half years, would you of your own accord say, let's go into the whole world and preach the gospel? Would you do that? Human nature is stuff that, such that we don't like to get out of our comfort zones. And God had protected them so they'd be strong, but now he had to get them moving. And so, this is what happened as the story unfolds. Revelation chapter 12, verse 15. She's being taken care of for three and a half years. 
in Jerusalem, protected by God, grows strong. Verse 15, then from his mouth a serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away like a torrent. That is symbolic imagery describing what happened in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 verse 1, after Stephen was martyred, it said that a persecution arose so that all of the Christians in Jerusalem were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Satan came upon that city and God allowed it. He came upon the church in a, in a persecution where people were killed. Peter was imprisoned. James was killed. Many, many martyrs and the saints scattered. And I can see the dragon going like this. There, that'll take care of that church. God gave three and a half years. I ended it overnight. The church was split and scattered everywhere. Look at the next phrase. Verse 16. This is where it gets really exciting. But, anytime you read that word but in the Bible, it's always got good news coming after it. It looked like the church was dead. But, the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Do you see the imagery? It is a picture of people. Just picture this for a moment. Like the Johnstown flood. Thousands of unsuspecting people and all of a sudden the dam breaks and water comes down like a wall and smashes through the city. And that is exactly what Satan did upon Jerusalem. It smashed through the city and picked up people and scattered them everywhere. And dragon was saying, they're dead, they're going to drown. And all of a sudden the earth in symbolic imagery opens up and the water is sucked up and drained. So the people aren't going to drown. They're not going to die. They're just scattered everywhere. And they start preaching. It's exactly what happened in persecution. What looked like the end of the church was the beginning of the church. Now they who would never have left the comfort zone of Jerusalem were like we a year ago pushed out. And they were going and they went with a new zeal to proclaim the gospel of God. That's the story. At the birth of Jesus, Satan is cast down. He's going to destroy the woman, the church. He decides in a brilliant idea that after three and a half years, he's going to send this flood. He sends a flood. The earth sucks up the water. Now this church is not just in one location, but it's everywhere. It's like the man several decades ago who had a problem with his clamming industry. He had a problem with starfish. The starfish at the bottom of the water were eating his clams before he could harvest them. So he got as many of those starfish that he could, and he took those starfish and cut them up in pieces and threw them back in the water and said, there, that'll take care of them. What he didn't know from Biology 101 is that every piece of a starfish that has at least a little portion of the center makes a whole new starfish. So instead of having a hundred starfish down there, he now had thousands. That's what happened to Satan. He thought he had killed the church, but now it was spread and ready to go. So I ask you, how's the dragon feel now? Verse 17. And here's where we get to the application. The dragon was enraged. Enraged at the woman, and he went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. Who are they? Those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. He is going to make war with you. And he's already begun. And in that warfare, three things to remember. First of all, we are engaged in spiritual warfare. I want to encourage you to think about that, to keep the balance of not becoming, in your mind, overly active and extreme that you see a demon behind every rock. But please don't go to the other extreme where we ignore the reality of the spiritual warfare.
when you see what takes place in Wichita, when you see what takes place in Washington, when you see what takes place in the Soviet Union, don't look at it as purely political. Don't look at it as simply men's minds changing. There's a spiritual warfare going on. When the coup took place in the Soviet Union, and it looked for a time as though the old regime of the Soviet Union would come back into power. I was so stunned because it took place on a Monday or a Sunday night. And that Friday, James Dobson with many, many other Christian people were going to be going over to the Soviet Union to make contacts with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our brother-in-law, Neil Nielsen, was going to be a part of that. And it was so exciting to see because there were people in the Soviet Union who asked him to come because they wanted him to teach morals in their school. Isn't that uh, unusual? In our country, we're trying to get rid of them. Now they're asking in the Soviet Union to come over. And when I saw that coup, my first thought was, Satan is working. Satan is active, and he is going to stop this no matter what. He would go to such great lengths as to bring a coup. Now, the world had all sorts of different reasons that they thought this would happen, but I feel very certain that that was a part of it. But it's so interesting. Just as the dragon spewed his flood into Jerusalem and thought that took care of the church, Christ overcame in the Soviet Union. So that now the Soviet Union... Russia and all the other republics are more open than they were two weeks ago. Open to the gospel. There's a spiritual warfare. And I would encourage you to see and keep your eyes open and know that the spiritual warfare is behind the events in history. Secondly, keep in mind that we can overcome Satan's schemes. Verse 11 says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Never forget that. Hang that verse in your mind. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, 19, that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. That's right now. The world, the Bible says, is under the control of the evil one. I don't think this is the millennium in which Satan is bound. If he's bound right now, he's on an awfully long chain. This right now, this old world is under the control of the evil one, the Bible says. And it goes on to say in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, that he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Do you believe that? That is the message of Revelation chapter 12. That when it looks as though Satan's going to be victorious, he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And you, by God's grace, can overcome him. But we need to resist the devil so that he will flee. We can overcome temptation. We're involved in a spiritual warfare, but what I find happens so much is that when we step out of our comfort zone and find ourselves involved in a ministry or a, a way of trying to reach the Lord, that is when Satan is going to be active in your life. If you want him to leave you alone, don't do anything for the Lord. He'll leave you alone. But you step out of your comfort zone and you make a commitment to do something within the kingdom of God and I guarantee you he will be active in your life. He will try to trip you up. We talk about this in our evangelism training and Tuesday night when it begins I'll be giving my lecture about this again, but it's so interesting how often when um, I share the gospel and I come to the point of asking a person if they'd like to make a commitment to Jesus Christ, it is then that the baby starts crying or the phone starts ringing. It's unbelievable. But just this last uh, two weeks ago when I had the opportunity of leading young man to the Lord, it was right at that point we're standing at the doorstep going through the whole gospel of this man and I said, would you like to receive the gift of eternal life? And a phone rang. And he walked in and closed the door. And I said to my team members, I said, we got to pray. Satan is working on him right now to take him away from them. I said, he may never come back to the store again. And we stood right there and we prayed. The door opened up and we had a chance to lead him to Christ. Satan is active. You make a commitment in evangelism and you'll find things happen in your family, to your health, in your job. It happens over and over again. And what happens so often is people then get discouraged and they quit because they don't see it's a spiritual warfare and we give in to Satan's attack. 
if you're acknowledging what's going on in the, in the world and Satan's work, then what we need to do is resist him and to stand up and overcome him by the blood of Jesus Christ and the word of the testimony of the Christian to be able to say, I know what you're doing, Satan, and I will not buckle. By God's grace, I will not buckle. I love the phrase there by the word of their testimony because I think it is when Christians can give testimony how God gave them strength beyond their normal strength to do what God had called them to do in spite of opposition. That is what gives other Christians courage to go on. And then finally, we must not love this life so much that we shrink away from death. Verse 11, the last phrase says, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. The spiritual warfare is nothing to take lightly. Satan, his stakes are high. And he looks at your life. He looked at Job's life. It says in chapter 13, we'll look at this more in detail next week, but it says in chapter 13, verse 7, that he was given power, the dragon was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And it goes on to say that there'll be many who will die. I think each one of us has to ask ourselves tonight whether your love for this world is so much and your grasp for the things of this world, the activities of this world, the people of this world is so great that you would not be willing to die for the cause of Jesus Christ. The people in Revelation in that first century, they did not love this life so much that they sh were shrinking back from death. And when you think of this morning, I was talking in the, one of the Sunday school classes about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who did not bow to that idol even though they knew they might die. Is our love of Jesus so much greater than our love of this world that we would say, Lord, if you take me, whatever it be, I'm willing to lay down my life for the sake of the gospel. We may be alive at that great tribulation that's described in Revelation 13, but the exciting thing is that the Lord says that those who go through that and one day stand with Him, these are those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb and their robes are clean as they stand before Him praising the Lord day and night. You are the offspring that Satan is attacking, but by God's grace one day you will be with him dressed in white. Let us pray. Father, tonight I would simply ask for two things. One, that you would give us eyes to see the spiritual warfare around us, that we would not be caught off guard. And secondly, O oh Lord, the courage to resist the evil one, not to fall to his temptation, and not to give up when he does battle against us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.